Good day, everyone, and welcome once again to the 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast. This is our 115th weekly episode. I'm your host, Rick Cole, and every week, right here on the Hockey Podcast Network, we take a trip down memory lane back in time 50 years and bring you all the hockey news that was happening back then exactly as it was reported in words of some of the greatest sports writers of all time. In this episode, we're looking at the last half of January 1972 as we try and catch up from our brief hiatus while we battled COVID. Now, if you like what we do here and every day on Twitter, you can help us out by going to patreon.com slash hockey 50 years and subscribe to the podcast. Subscribers not only get early access to each week's free podcast, but we have some really neat stuff and special content where we're allowed to delve more deeply and in greater detail into the stories that dominated the hockey world 50 years ago. We're starting to get back to strength and we'll have some new content for our Patreon subscribers in the next couple of weeks. And this is going to be some really interesting historical stuff you probably won't be able to find anywhere else. So I have a brief uh, COVID COVID, uh, update for you today, my own COVID update, I guess. Things are improving here at our end. Uh, I'm not sure if the voice is sounding any better. Hope it is. I definitely feel stronger. Breathing is not quite so labored, and that's the biggest improvement that I'm experiencing right now. The cognitive impairment is the slowest part of the recovery. I still search for words at times. Uh, I'll try and edit this as best I can so I don't catch myself kind of stopping and searching for words. It happens from time to time, and I'm making way too many errors. It takes me uh, twice as long, uh, at least, to do the Twitter account every day and things like typing out and reading the script. Uh, Words and sentences that used to flow really easily are now a little bit of a struggle to come up with, but it's better than last week and it'll get better next week, I'm sure. So enough of all this. Let's get to some 50 years old hockey news. So we begin our coverage this week with an update on the National Hockey League standings as of January 17th. And in the Eastern Division, the Boston Bruins we're leading the New York Rangers by two points, 65 to 63. The Bruins a 29 seven and seven record. The Rangers 28 seven and seven. It feels so good to read these standings compared to the mess that the National Hockey League has now with shootouts and overtime. I don't mind overtime. Just give them two points for a win, no points for a loss. Be done with it. But this shootout mess is just disgusting to me. I hate it. Uh, third place in the East, Montreal. With 57, the Leafs holding down the fourth and final playoff spot with 50 and Detroit seven points back at 43. But we would see that that seven point lead, even in January, wasn't a safe lead for the Maple Leafs. Way back at the bottom, Vancouver 27 and Buffalo with 26. In the West Division, Chicago was running away with it after being challenged early by Minnesota. The Blackhawks 63 points on a 29-9-5 record. North Stars back at 50. The uh, Blues and the Seals tied with 37. And Pittsburgh five points back of them along with Philadelphia 32. Both still held out hopes at making the playoffs. The Kings were bringing up the rear with a meager 26 points. Right off the bat on that Monday, the World Hockey Association was uh, making news already. First up, there was a significant step forward for the league when they announced that the New York franchise, uh, as yet unnamed, had confirmed that it had secured dates for the 1972-73 season to play home games at Madison Square Garden. The WHA wasn't going to get off the ground in any serious matter without a New York team, at least that was the general wisdom in both the WHA and the NHL at that time. So this bit of news seemed to give the W the momentum that it was going to need to try and get, as we say, off the ground. 
Also that day, the owner of the Ontario World Hockey Association franchise, still without an arena or a city in which to play, made an offer to buy the Toronto Marlboros Junior A team from Maple Leaf Gardens, Inc. Harold Ballard, now the alleged president of the Gardens and all its assets, including the Toronto Maple Leafs, has decided that the Junior A team... uh, is unnecessary to his organization. And that's, uh, Hal says, because NHL sponsorship was no longer allowed in junior hockey. So it really was just uh, uh, an anchor on, on his organization. He decided he wanted to dump it. And, of course, if you knew Harold Ballard, making or keeping a fast buck was the way to do things in the world in 1972. Uh, we'll come back to this a little later in the show because a few more prominent suitors than Doug Michelle, the owner of the Ontario WHA franchise, will surface. And we'll tell you about that as we go along kind of chronologically at this time. Well, you got to feel sorry for Detroit Red Wings forward Guy Schron. I really shouldn't giggle here. Uh, Guy's had a rough season and it got a lot rougher this past weekend. He started out well with the Red Wings, playing left wing and a bit of center, and then he suffered a serious face injury, broken cheekbone and jaw. He was hospitalized for a week or so, uh, wasn't uh, coming back really well because had to eat through a straw for quite a while. Finally, frustrated that he wasn't playing, and Ned Harkness, frustrated that a good young player wasn't playing, got trainer Lefty Wilson to rig up some sort of a face mask for him so that he could at least get out on the ice and play, and that got him back into the lineup. But he he wasn't at his best yet. It was pretty depressing, but I can imagine for the kid. Uh, You know, taking nourishment through a straw and generally weakened by the entire ordeal. But he was finally getting back to strength, starting to feel like of himself. And after he left an Olympia practice uh, on the weekend, he was confronted by a criminal who not only robbed him at knife point of his wallet, his U.S. work visa, and some other property, but he forced Sharon to drive him in his car to a remote location. That's right. He kidnapped him. And at that point where they got to wherever that the car ended up at, he forced Guy out of the vehicle and left them stranded somewhere out in the middle of nowhere in Detroit. Uh, Guy finally did manage to get some assistance, and while the episode did end with no further harm to the player, the same unfortunately could not be said for his car. This week was really beginning with a lot of news. The Canadians got news as the week began too. Goalie Ken Dryden, who don't forget still qualifies as a rookie in this season, even though he won the Conn Smythe Trophy last spring for the Habs, he was cleared to play by team doctors and he was returned Wednesday night against Toronto. He'd been missing for a week or so with a uh, bad back that was uh, described as, as muscle spasms. At least there was no disc damage and he he didn't need surgery so the only question now was would he be able to play at the level at which he was performing before he went down with the sore back and we would see that Ken Dryden didn't lose a thing. Scotty Bowman the coach of the Canadians uh, always had a reputation of not really enjoying his interactions with sports writers. Uh, He had a conversation with Ted Blackman of the Montreal Gazette, and this started out as a conversation about sports writers, uh, and it was maybe a rationalization that Scotty gives us about why he kind of feels this way, but it turned into a discussion about something else, and we'll just give you uh, what Scotty told Ted Blackman. Scotty starts by saying, look, I got no beef with the press. Uh, Scotty, by the way, talking very quietly in this interview, had a really bad cold. Probably sounded worse than I do right now. Uh, Scotty says, it's just that three papers carrying carried a note saying friends of mine gave me a $600 watch in St. Louis. You should have seen the trouble I had explaining that to the customs people coming back from St. Louis. Now, Scotty says that they were coming back from a game in his former city, St. Louis, and he wasn't too happy about it right there because the Canadians had been 
trounced by the Blues by a score of 7-3. So uh, Scotty says, I come on a plane three hours after the team with my wife and the baby in her arms. It's 20 below or something outside, and we have to wait 45 minutes for baggage. Then we go into a room where they search the luggage. A quick side note here. I uh, was on a flight with Scotty Bowman from Tampa back to Buffalo uh, just a few years ago, and uh, I'd noticed Scotty... uh, uh, in the uh, few rows back of me. When we got off the plane, I went up, introduced myself, surprisingly, he told me he knew who I was. And as we went both to get our luggage, we uh, sat down and we talked for about 35 minutes. And we were talking about the expansion draft in 1967. He gave me a little test. He says, I can't remember when we took Glenn Hall. Were we picking second or third? And with Scotty, you know, that's a test. He knew exactly when they took Glenn Hall. And I said, well, if you remember correctly, you guys picked third, and you took him then. I told him that Terry Sawchuk had gone first and Bernie Prant second. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, that's right. Right then, Scotty opened up, and we had a wonderful conversation about that draft and a lot of other things, and it was a really, really positive experience. So anyway, Scotty Bowman is actually a good guy in airports. He's not always uh, grumpy like he says he was this day. So... Scotty was saying that uh, when he got the customs, they searched it, and he says, look, I got no beef with the customs people. They're only doing their job. But the customs guy asked Scotty if he bought anything, and Scotty says, no, he didn't. And then he says, well, did he acquire anything? And Scotty says, no, hell, I'm not even thinking about the watch at that time. It's right on the wrist, out in plain view. He's not trying to hide it. So the guy says, obviously, having read the newspapers, where's the $600 watch? Scotty says, I I don't have one of those. I got this, a $50 watch. Well, the guy says, Scotty, you owe us $280 duty on the $600 watch. So Scotty says, oh boy, I tell my wife to get in the cab and I'll be home later. She gets in one cab. They won't take her to Dorval. So she calls another cab. Same story. They won't go to Dorval. There's no Dorval cabs. So she's back in the airport. Now she's getting hysterical with the baby and all that. Scotty says, I'm trying to explain that 50 guys in St. Louis threw a dinner at five bucks a head. What kind of a watch can you buy with that anyway? The guy gives me a receipt and later I prove the watch costs $45. All cleared up. Scotty gets his money back, so really, it was just a $600 thing that got me ticked off. The press isn't responsible for the team. We're playing bad on the road because we're not getting much of an effort. But the press almost cost Scotty $600. And another story about the customs at Buffalo. I took a peewee traveling team to Buffalo for a hockey tournament one weekend, And uh, crazy as it was, coaching the team, we won the tournament, and they gave us this big, huge trophy. So we proudly proceed back across the Peace Bridge at Buffalo with this big trophy in the uh, front of my big Ford Bronco in the day. And same question, did you acquire anything? And I said, nothing but this lovely piece of hardware. And the guy says, how much did that cost? I said, I didn't cost me anything. We got it for free. We won it. And the guy sent us over to customs where they tried to make us pay $200 duty on a trophy that obviously we won, we didn't buy. Uh, I happened to carry a badge at that time, and I used the badge to speak to the customs supervisor who apologized to me, and we were sent on our way. A note from January 20th, a happy note. Uh, Punch M. Lack, whom reported last week had suffered a heart attack, was re- now improving, and by midweek, he was removed from the cardiac care unit of Deaconess Hospital in Buffalo. He was installed into a private room where he was to recuperate for the next couple of weeks, barring any complications or visitors upsetting him. Uh, they kept the visitors to a bare minimum on that. But you know what? They did let King Clancy and I understand. We were getting news of cities that were pursuing NHL teams. Uh, First of all, Kansas City uh, had at least two groups that were making applications for uh, 
a team in Kansas City, hopefully to start in 1974. They didn't even have a big league arena in Kansas City yet. The Arizona Republic in Phoenix carried a story about that city getting closer to uh, having an NHL team. Go figure. Phoenix in 1972 having an NHL team. Here we are 50, 50 years later. And they have the Coyotes, which isn't even an NHL team. And then later on in the month, uh, several wire services carried a story that Nick Maletti, a sportsman from Cleveland, uh, Ohio, who owned the AHL Barons, was working on building a team somewhere out in the sticks about 20 miles from downtown Cleveland. And he was planning on putting an NHL team there as well. NHL, pretty popular well, with people getting their franchises. I got a little kick out of this story this week. Long Island Ducks owner Al Barron, who uh, demanded that the new Nassau County Coliseum, where the New York uh, new New York team was going to be housed, would give him playing dates for the Eastern League team. Well, Al Barron told the World Hockey Association, which is, by the way, holding its first player draft in early February, he told the WHA to keep its blankety-blank hands off his players. Following the announcement of Bill Hunter, owner of the Edmonton franchise in the WHA and director of something called playing activities for the WHA, that the WHA would be drafting from all levels of the game, Barron sent a telegram to WHA President Gary Davidson, and the telegram said this, I understand that you will hold your player draft February 11th to 14th. I'm warning you that drafting any of the Long Island Ducks players will be in violation of my players' contracts. Barron pointed out in the telegram that despite the National Hockey League's designation of the Eastern League as an amateur league, the EHL is a professional league with players signed the contracts. Good luck with that, Al. Milton Gross of something called the North American Newspaper Alliance, NANA for short, has the goods on a WHA offer to Derek Sanderson. Milt writes, 12 cities have been enfranchised in the embryonic world hockey association and the owners of the teams are prepared to begin waiving unheard of amounts of money in front of the biggest names on the National Hockey League. Undoubtedly, there are others, but the one we definitely know about is Derek Sanderson of the Bruins, possibly the most colorful player in the league if you haven't seen Eddie Shack, and at least as far as he relates to younger fans. Sanderson has been contacted by the Miami people who are building their own arena and claim they will spend any amount of money to recruit NHL stars to build the best hockey team in the shortest period of time. Lofty goals, and I think every team has that. Talk Ben Hatskin in uh, Winnipeg. They have offered, the the Miami team called the Screaming Eagles, they have offered 23-year-old Derek the best contract ever offered a player in any team sport. Now hold your breath. This seems to be too much to believe, but Nana has been told that Sanderson, in the last year of a $50,000 contract with the Boston Bruins, has been tendered a $2.5 million pact. It calls for a yearly salary of 250000 big ones a season for 10 seasons. And in the last four, he doesn't even have to play. He could be a scout or whatever function he feels like he wants to be with the Miami team. The money would be guaranteed and put into escrow. Oh, there's that dirty word, escrow, that's around 50 years later. Once Derek signs, the $2.5 million would be his, whether or not the WHA ever gets into active operation, whether or not the Miami team folds, and despite any possible lawsuit by the Bruins or the NHL itself. Now that's rating, and it's tempting, and our source, Milt says, discloses Derek won't entertain anything less than that, which means that Sanderson is in the position to push for something more. 
the Miami Screaming Mimis or whatever the heck they were called, uh, you know, they never did get off the ground. But at this time, they were the front and center with the WHA, making an offer to another very prominent player. Uh, they made a similar offer to Toronto goalie Bernie Perrant. Now, Perrant was an ideal target. He'd been traded to Toronto from Philadelphia, the home of his bride. And if you don't know that that's a significant thing, you don't know, happily at that time, married hockey players. Uh, Bernie was uh, feeling he was disrespected by the Maple Leafs upon his arrival uh, in Toronto after the trade. And that was disrespected in terms of his contract. He felt they didn't live up to certain things that had been promised to him. Uh, by Jim Gregory and Harold Ballard when he arrived, actually Stafford Smythe at the time he arrived. Uh, and later in the fall in the training camp, again, they had trouble and he held out for a bit. Now, at this time, the Leafs were not having a great season, barely hanging on to a playoff spot, very inconsistent. And Bernie was uh, not the best goalie in the league at the time, very, very, very good and showing the potential to be the all-time great that he would end up. But all this situation ended up uh, uh, added up to a very disgruntled athlete who might listen to an offer from a rival league. So you put this together with a quintessential Philadelphia lawyer named Howard Casper, and you have a recipe for disaster for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Word began to leak out that the screaming, whatever they are, uh, thought they might uh, have made a similar offer to the one we mentioned to Sanderson, but people weren't uh, really sure about that. Perrant maintained that an offer or talks had taken place, but no offer was finalized and he had not agreed to anything, but that if they were talking real money and the amount suggested, he'd be a fool not to at least explore the validity of the finances. And that is exactly what he instructed Howard Casper to do. Near the end of the month, things seemed to calm down a bit in the Perrant front, but, uh, then they kind of blew up again very late in the month uh, because Casper, the lawyer, played it really, really well. And the Maple Leafs, thanks to Harold Ballard, well, quite frankly, they blew up with Bernie Perrant. Casper, you see, decided that he was not going to talk to Toronto General Manager Jim Gregory, who was more of a voice of reason and very importantly was a guy who was going to obey his boss that is Ballard and do exactly what Ballard would tell him to do so Casper said we're not going to put Jim Gregory in a position of being the fall guy here if the Leafs are going to lose Bernie Perrant it's going to be the owner's fault not the GM's so Casper told everyone I'm not talking to anybody but Harold Ballard. Well, Ballard says that these guys aren't going to tell me what to do and you'll talk to me or nobody else. Now, Ballard was a blowhard who'd not back down. Casper knew that, that Ballard would stick to his guns even if sticking to his guns was not in his best interest. And in this case, it wasn't going to be. So Ballard had an interview with Milt Dunnell of the Toronto Star and he basically said, hey, I don't have to talk to Bernie Perrant. I don't have to talk to his lawyer. If the money is real, if it's that good, Bernie should jump at an offer of that magnitude. And he should take it. Good luck to him. And, of course, that got back to Casper. There was no counter offer. There was no offer of discussion. Ballard thought he held all the cards that this money couldn't be real. Now, here, here's things that, the, from what we've been able to find out through all this, it was quite likely, possible anyway, that a pal Hal had treated Bernie Perrant with the respect that a player of that caliber deserved and would get 50 years later. Had he realized, like others in the NHL did, that the WHA was very close to being a real thing, you know, they might have won Bernie Perron over. They could have done so many things to make Bernie Perron stay in Toronto a happy one, but they did nothing. More importantly, Harold Ballard did nothing. 
with the way the situation had been poorly set up, it was inevitable that Bernie Perrant would leave and so would the hopes of the Maple Leaf Hockey Club turning out for generations to come. You know what? There was even talk that the Maple Leafs had a deal in place that would have brought Doug Favell to Toronto and another good Philadelphia player. I heard it was Ed Van Imp. I don't know if it's true. In exchange for Perrant and the Leafs would probably have gotten a first round draft pick in that deal as well. That never happened because Ballard wouldn't consider it. Kind of a mess up was the Vancouver Canucks in in this their uh, second NHL season. I'll give you an example of how things were being run in Vancouver these days. Bobby Olan was a fine but very small prospect of the Vancouver Canucks, and he was setting the AHL on fire playing for the uh, Rochester Americans, the Canucks' number one farm team. Now, the Canucks were slated to play in Buffalo, and uh, general manager Bud Poyle called up the uh, Amerks got a hold of Bobby Lalonde and instructed him to grab his gear, get uh, a bus to Buffalo, and he would suit up for a one-game trial for the Canucks against the Sabres. Well, Bobby did exactly as he was instructed to do. He showed up at the odd where he was supposed to meet up with an equally surprised coach, Hal Laco, had no idea that Lalonde had been summoned and was supposed to play. Well, Laco simply told Bobby that the press box at the odd had, was very nice and warm in Buffalo, and it had a lovely view, and that was the only way that he was going to see this game. Laco told reporters he didn't, quote, wanted to disrupt a successful lineup. Hal, one scribe reportedly asked, have you looked at the standings lately? Of course, this little scenario drew derision and ugly comments about Laco's future uh, with the Canucks. But by the end of the week, several Vancouver writers were informing us through their sources with the team that while there was no official announcement to be made, they had been told by these sources that Laco had been informed that his job was safe at least until the end of the season, which probably meant to a lot of guys he's going to be fired next. Next week, we all wondered if ownership, which at this time was quite a mess all on its own, was looking at the performance of general manager Poyle. Everyone in hockey these days was all agog over the white skates being worn by the California Golden Seals at that time. Uh, if you were around in those days, you'll recall the furor they caused, and if you weren't, you've heard the stories over and again. Well, here's one that I hadn't even remembered about. Charlie Finley, the owner of the Seals, contributed to the controversy around the white skates, and not in a very good way. Uh, Finley owns a baseball team called the Oakland A's, and they were the first major league team to wear white shoes. Well, Finley claimed that the A's footwear was <laughs> made from the skins of albino kangaroos. Yeah, he actually said that. Uh, he even got more outlandish with the seal skates. I thought for somewhere I had he heard that the uh, skates were tacks made from kangaroo leather. Nope. Charlie Finley says that the tax that the California Golden Seals were wearing were crafted from the skins of white polar bears. Uh, white was the only variety I knew of at that time. Even back then, polar bears were considered uh, endangered, and this certainly riled up animal activists, not the sort of negative publicity that this financially struggling franchise was in need of at the time. We told you a little earlier about the Toronto Marlboros being up for sale. Well, another group did surface that was making a serious effort to purchase the club. Uh, Bobby Haggart was a former trainer with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, he ended up getting let go because of some outside uh, jobs that he did because the Leafs paid him such a paltry sum uh, for his services. Bobby Haggard surfaced with a group uh, that said they were delivering an offer for the team. Uh, the group included a couple of pretty prominent uh, hockey people. 
Alan Eagleson, the executive director of the National Hockey League Players Association, and his star client, Bobby Orr, plus a few other unnamed hockey players, were involved in the group that wanted to buy the Marlies. They said they had the money, they had the wherewithal, they had the skill, and they would by the team. Now, Harold Ballard, in his consistently inconsistent manner, now said that he was thinking of changing his mind and keeping the team. Al, if you're going to sell anything, Hal, please sell the Leafs. Another bit about Derek Sanderson right about this time as well. Uh, he was talking uh, with New York sports writer Mark Rusky, who was doing a feature on fighting, And I'm not going to get into all the rationalizations and justifications about how desperately important fighting is to hockey, because it's not. But you know what? Derek Sanderson just shows you, I guess, his level of what he thought fighting was. Derek Sanderson said this about fighting. It's like what the United States is doing in Vietnam. Sometimes you have to fight for peace. Yep, he said that. So this week, four teams remain in the National Football League playoffs, and that means only four teams left for you to bet on at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the National Football League. Counting down to Super Bowl 56, new customers can get 56 to 1 odds on any team. Bet just $5 and get 280 in free bets if your team wins. Not a new customer? You can experience the conference championships with same game parlays. That's right. Combine multiple bets from the same games for a bigger payout. The more legs you add, the more money that you can win. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. And best of all, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use promo code THPN and get 56 to 1 odds on any NFL team. Bet just $5 and win 280 in free bets if your team wins. That's promo code THPN for 56 to 1 odds at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. You must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. And this is for only new customers. Minimum $5 deposit and a $1 wager are required. One per customer and some restrictions do apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for all the details. Have a gambling problem? Please call 1-800-GAMBLER. The final week of January began with a sign, yet another sign, that the World Hockey Association just might be for real after all. Jack Kelly was the highly respected coach of the Boston University varsity hockey, varsity hockey team, and he signed a seven-year contract to become the first general manager coach of the WHA New England team, which according to team president Howard Baldwin, by the way, really good guy, the team will be called the Whalers. See that WHA in the first three letters of the name? Good, good, uh, a little ploy there by the by the team. Now, Ron Ryan, a coach of the Colgate University hockey team, he went along with Jack Kelly to the WHA as his assistant GM, and we figured he would probably get some of the coaching duties as well. At this time, the Philadelphia Flyers had a young winger down in the American Hockey League at Richmond. They think this kid can be an NHL player if he cuts down on the sc- stupid penalties and the psychotic behavior that he'd been displaying for most of this AHL season. So they contacted uh, the young guy named David Schultz and they told him exactly that. Cut down the stupid penalties, control yourself a bit, maybe you could make the NHL. The guy who told him this was Flyers coach Fred Shiro who seemed to have taken a liking to this kid 
And uh, the thinking was, if Fred Shiro can manage to survive this first NHL coaching season with the Flyers, Schultz might have a shot with the team on down the road. A lot of people in the AHL were actually scared by this guy. And uh, Philadelphia writer Bill Fleischman said that the Flyers were so scared of his behavior, that's why they were holding him down in the league. They also thought he needed to improve his skating. The National Hockey League All-Star Game was played on January 25th at Bloomington, Minnesota. Now, if you don't know why it was Bloomington, that's the small community wedged in between St. Paul and Minneapolis. And that's where the North Stars Arena was, and they had been awarded the game for 1972. Now, in those days, the Ballyhoo, the... uh, publicity was nothing like you're seeing today for the all-star game the outdoor game the uh, legends game whatever they do it's wasn't anything like this it wasn't certainly as tiring as as the crap you get now is but there was still a lot of uh uh I guess pre pre publicity for it. Usually, the announcement of the rosters was uh, one of the things that uh, got a lot of publicity at that time. Now, as usual, happens today, just like it happened back then. The coaches who were not involved in the game whined about their various players on the respective teams were overlooked or left off the game rosters. Noted hockey genius Ned Harkness of the Red Wings, not a coach, but the general manager, he was dumb enough to whine about Mickey Redman and Gary Bergman not making the game. Of course, endearing himself to sports writers who covered the sport of hockey everywhere. Well, of course, the uh, sports writers went to the coach of the Eastern Division, a fellow by the name of Alistair Wences McNeil, and he was the Eastern Division coach by virtue of his having been the coach of last spring's Stanley Cup winning Montreal Canadiens, and of course, we all know the story by now of Al being promoted to be the GM of the American Hockey League team the Canadians had in Nova Scotia. Well, one writer went to Al and said, Ned's complaining that you left a couple of his players off the team. Al McNeil had a ready answer for Ned Harkness. The way to have Harkness satisfied is for him to win the Stanley Cup. Then as coach, he could pick the team next year. I know he's got to sell his club, but I'm sure as soon as he picked his guys, he'd find 10 other guys who disagree with him. In the case of Ned Harkness, on any given day, you can find a lot more than 10 hockey people who would disagree with Ned Harkness on pretty much any hockey subject, except how to anticipate or intimidate young college hockey players, which apparently Ned was pretty good at. Another coach who had a problem with the uh, selections of the players. This was on the Western Division side. Jackie Gordon of the North Stars was upset that players like Danny Grant, Cesar Maniego, Gump Worsley, guys like that weren't selected to be starters. But Billy Ray, a much more veteran guy around the hockey world, just shrugged it off and didn't even make a comment. There were a couple of interesting uh, notes in the lineups for the All-Star game. Uh, especially the numbers of players wearing, which I always, for some reason, took great, great interest in. Ken Dryden wore number one, and Jills Villemere number 30 for the East. Why didn't Ken Dryden wear number 29? Probably because the people who run the NHL lacked the vision, the wisdom, the creativity, or the vision even, to make a number 29. They gave Ken Dryden number one. They maybe didn't even know that Ken Dryden or number 29. Yet Red Berenson didn't have his number, usual number seven. He was wearing number five. Rick Martin, another number seven, was wearing number six because Phil Alp Esposito did get his number seven. Rod Gilbert, another very good number seven, wore number eight. Dale Talon was given number nine because for the first time ever, in, well, ever, in how many years, Gordy Howe wasn't playing. Gilbert Perrault did not get his number 11, though. He wore number 10 because Vic Hadfield had seniority and he got 11. Uh, Paul Henderson didn't get number uh, 19 because Jean Rattel got that with seniority. Paul wore number 17. And on the West, 
Well, we didn't have too many real crazy surprises. Doug Moans had number uh, six, which is pretty interesting. Bobby and Dennis Hall did get their numbers nine and ten, which uh, was pretty normal. Bobby Clark did not get number 16. Bobby Clark wore 15 because Chico Mackey, another one of those, I think, nine Blackhawks, had seniority and got number 16. The All-Star game itself wasn't a terrible game. The Eastern Division defeated the Western Division 3-2. to two, But if this had been a baseball contest, both teams would have thrown no hitters. The West actually had a 2 nothing lead on goals by Bobby Hall and Simon Nole. Uh, the Hall in the first, Nole then made it 2 nothing early in the second. Jean Rattel and Johnny McKenzie scored for the East to tie it in the middle frame. And at uh, 2 9 of the third period, Phil Esposito scored the winner. East wins 3-2. to two. They outshot the West 30-27. to 27. And that was that. One of the more anticipated stories that was coming out of All-Star Week was the meeting of the National Hockey League Board of Governors to decide how the league would be realigned with expansion to 16 teams in the fall of 1972 with the additions of Long Island and Atlanta. It was generally thought that a 4-14 division uh, setup would be the ideal way to go, but that wasn't everybody's ideal setup, it turned out. The rules the NHL had in place, which, by the way, were not really uh, binding rules. They could change it like they did when they expanded it all. Uh, But the rules were that it would only take one dissenting vote from any team, from any governor, to scuttle any proposed plan, in which case the league would maintain its present two-division setup, and that's exactly what happened. After all the fuss about realignment, They took a vote, Charles O. Finley didn't like it, and there would be two 18 divisions for the 1972-73 season. Clarence Campbell said to to eliminate the uh, two 18 divisions, it would emphasize great disparity between the clubs and a four-team division. Oh, yeah? How do you think teams in, the team in uh, Long Island or Atlanta is going to feel about telling their fans were eighth instead of saying they were just fourth? What a dumb idea. More examples of the perpetual lack of creativity and vision that the NHL has always had. All-Star Week had another event that was... Uh, probably the most bizarre story of the entire hockey season, maybe for several seasons, and it unfolded this week in Minneapolis and carried on for a while after this. And It's a tough story to report, but it caught my uh, interest back then as a person who was actually that early in his life considering a police career. Dan Meyer, the owner of the Salt Lake Golden Eagles of the Western Hockey League, was killed when he fell from his 19th floor hotel room to the roof of a swimming pool 16 stories below. Meyer had left a Western Hockey League meeting approximately 10 minutes earlier explaining to uh, the buddies that he was with there that he had to make some phone calls. Witnesses to the fall included Paul Henderson of the Toronto Maple Leafs and Pitt Martin of the Chicago Blackhawks, who were in the room in the very next door to Meyer, and Bobby Hull and Chico Mackey of the Blackhawks, who occupied a room one floor below Meyer's room. The players were resting in preparation for the All-Star game when they heard glass breaking. We had just come back to our room about 10 minutes before it happened, said Paul Henderson. My knees are still shaking. Paul said it was a terrible thing to see that the two players saw Meyer climb out onto the steel beam outside of the window after hearing the glass break. Martin said he saw the man's face. We heard one crash, then another, as though somebody was putting a chair through the window. 
Meyer occupied room 1911, Henderson and Martin were in 1913, and below, in 1813, Bobby Hull was dozing and Mackie was sitting by the window, just kind of read, reading at the time. Chico hollered at me, he saw him fall, said Hull. I just had dozed off after doing a crossword puzzle. Bobby Hull ran upstairs in his bare feet, his shirt tail dangling over his trousers. There was a key in the outside of his door, Bobby said, so he went in. Uh, Hull said that uh, Meyer's glasses were on the floor and so was his wallet. The glasses were broken and there was a little blood on them. There was some blood on the inside knob of the door to the hall as well. The wallet did contain money and credit cards, so it didn't look like a robbery. From a picture of Meyer in the wallet, Martin identified the man he saw falling. Martin and Henderson emphasized they heard no struggle. Uh, Henderson said, I didn't go out in the hall right away because I, I was scared. Uh, Paul said that they didn't know what had happened, so immediately, of course, they called hotel security. And <laughs> As you one would think, Henderson and Martin were immediately moved to another hotel room. A Western Hockey League official said that Meyer had been in good spirits when he left the meeting. A spokesman in the Bloomington Police Department said that there was no evidence of foul play at this time. Tim Moriarty of uh, Newsday, the New York uh, news publication, newspaper, had a story about the incident as well. Uh, Moriarty wrote that the fans saw Jules Villemer, the Rangers, hold the West scoreless during his half-game stint. They saw Bobby Orr block a bullet shot by Bobby Hull late in the game when the West was trying to tie the score. Now Orr emerged from that play with severe pain in his lower growing. What the fans didn't see was a local coroner who showed up at the uh, Met Sports Center not to see the game but to interrogate four all-stars who witnessed the tragedy involving Dan Meyer. Pitt Martin of the Blackhawks, Paul Henderson of the Maple Leafs occupied the room next door and uh, directly below were Bobby Hall and Chico Mackey. Uh, Martin said he became alarmed when he heard a crashing noise next door. It was apparently caused when Meyer, 45 and the father of three, shattered the window of his room and climbed out onto an outside ledge. Martin said, Paul went to the window, saw this man out there, and said he's going to jump. I looked out and saw the man. It was so unreal. He hung on the ledge for a couple seconds, and then he let go. As we mentioned, Bobby Hall rushed from the floor below up to the room, and uh, he did tell Moriarty what he came upon when he arrived at the scene. He said there was blood on the inside of the door. The man's wallet was on the floor, along with some papers and two pens. His eyeglasses, with one lens broken, were in the bathroom. Hall admitted he was shaken by the incident, but Pitt Martin was the worst affected and considered actually not playing in the All-Star game. However, Pitt reconsidered and he was a starting center for the West and set up a goal by Hull in the first period. <laughs> At the end of that period, the coroner was standing in the hallway to the dressing room waiting to question him, Hull, Mackey, and Henderson. For all the players involved, it was quite an ordeal. It was something you see in the movies, but I can't believe when you become part of something like that was what Bobby Hull said. It was terribly frightening. Pitt Martin said, I'd like to erase it from my mind, but I can't. The story became a little more mysterious, though, a few days later when uh, Brent Checkets, who's the fine uh, sports editor of the Deseret News, uh, he reported that contrary to earlier reports, Dan Meyer's death was still under investigation by the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office. And according to a statement, Craig Palmer, the investigator for the uh, office, re uh, the uh, statement he released via phone, foul play, he says, may have been involved. Here's the statement they put out. The Hennepin County Medical Examiner has completed the autopsy on Dan Meyer. 
Uh, the cause of death has been determined to be multiple traumatic injuries due to a fall. The manner in which the death occurred is still under investigation by this office. This office is working closely with both the Bloomington Police Department and the Criminal Division of the Hennepin County Sheriff's Department. It is the decision of this office that the classification of the death is undetermined at this time. It may be changed in the future. Several items found in the room of the deceased resulted in the continuance of the investigation. We have gone over the room with a fine tooth comb. We have gathered fingerprints, taken photos, had artist sketches drawn, and confiscated physical evidence. So this story was not yet quite over. So as we wind down this episode, a little more on ice, well, at least in the uh, hockey news uh, world of regular hockey stuff, uh, out of Pittsburgh, amid rumors that he was considering coming back to play after five years since his last game, Red Kelly went to the ownership of the Pittsburgh Penguins and asked to be relieved of his duties as the Penguins' general manager. Red said he would continue as a team's coach. He would not play. That request by the ownership was granted. Red was simply coach, and Vice President Jack Riley resumed his duties as general manager's duties he had previously given to Red Kelly. And finally this week, uh, a huge eight player trade was consummated between the Philadelphia Flyers and Los Angeles Kings, a deal that was clearly designed by both teams to shake up two underachieving squads. The Kings parted with their two leading scorers and their only member of the All-Star team. The two teams, both in the midst of disappointing seasons, completed the major trade in hopes of finding that elusive winning combination that would carry them into the National Hockey League playoffs. The Flyers are fifth in the Western Division. The Kings dead last at seventh. Going to the Flyers are Eddie Joyal, a center, right winger Bill Cowboy Flett, left winger Ross Lonsbury, and defenseman Jean Potvin. Joining the LA Kings would be center Jimmy Johnson, right winger Serge Bernier, left winger Billy Lesouk, and defenseman Larry Brown. Joyal, 31 years old, and Fletcher is 28, were the only players who had been with the Kings throughout their five year existence. They, of course, rank 1 2 in goals for Los Angeles with 94 and 77 respectively and Joel holds the Kings season team record with 33 goals in 68-69 but both of these guys have had underachieving seasons the last two years. Larry Regan says we haven't had much consistency up front from the forwards so we gave them up. Lonsberry, 25, was the only L.A. player named to the NHL All-Star team this season. He'd scored 20 and 25 goals in his two seasons with the Kings despite several injuries. He had nine goals this season, originally began his career with the Boston Bruins. John Potvin, a 22-year-old defenseman, is playing his first full NHL seasons, and all four were to join the Flyers in Philadelphia for their game against Boston. Johnson, Bernie, and Lesuk were to join the Kings that evening. Brown, recovering from mononucleosis, wouldn't be playing until sometimes next month. Johnson, uh, 29, is the oldest of the four going to the Kings. He got 13 goals and 15 assists this season. Bernier, who's only 24, had 12 goals this year after scoring 23 last year. He's the guy the Kings consider the key in the entire deal. We would keep a close eye on these two teams the rest of the year to see just how this would work out. The papers in Philadelphia were skeptical, saying that the Flyers have been losing trades for the last few years, and this was another one that was dooming them to miss the playoffs. 
So that is this week's show, everyone. And what did we learn from a very eventful couple of weeks at the end of January? Well, we had a lot of WHA developments, and we're starting to get a pretty good idea that this thing was going to cause some serious ripples in the hockey pond. The NHL announced that it can't even come to an agreement on a divisional divisional setup for the league, so it looked like for another season it was going to be two eight-team divisions. And uh, we learned of the mysterious death of the owner of the Western Hockey League, Salt Lake City Golden Eagles. Now here's some stories we're working on for next week's show as we try to return to our normal weekly uh, news format. The WHA Ontario team appeared to be closer to becoming a reality, and we're going to tell you where we figured they were going to land to play. A city long rumored for an NHL franchise was making a bid for another uh, chance to uh, enter the league. Vancouver finally got a farm team much closer to home, and this one was interesting because of the repercussions uh, of something that would happen later in the year. The Russians said that they had formally issued a challenge to the Montreal Canadiens to play a game or series, and the Montreal people have simply ignored the suggestions. We'll talk about this and ask the question, could this lead to something bigger than just a club team against a Soviet club team? Stay tuned. The 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast is produced by Andy Cole. Can't thank him enough for all his hard work. Andy will produce podcasts professionally. If you're thinking of getting uh, one going, get hold of me. I'll hook you up with the best in the business. He's a true media professional. Very popular Juno-nominated Toronto Indie Rock Group, the Rural Alberta Advantage, provides our intro and exit music. Uh, They are hoping to get back performing live this year. You ever get a chance to see them play don't miss it. Other musical pieces and sound effects are created by Andy Cole as well. Our research comes from the files of the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, and of course our fine sponsor, newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive on the planet. Please don't forget our other sponsor, as February dawns, they're opening up again. The Breakwall Brewing Company, creators of some of the finest craft brewers in the country, are going to be open again, 50% capacity. And then a few weeks later, they're going to be wide open. I hope maybe this summer some of our listeners can get to Port Coburn and we'll meet up for a beer and a burger at the break wall. You can find us on Twitter every day at, at Hockey 50 Years, on Facebook under 50 Years Ago in Hockey. Our WordPress site is hockey50yearsago.com. And your favorite podcast app can get us every uh, time the podcast comes out. And of course, the Hockey Podcast Network is our home. Thanks again to everyone who tunes in. Uh, we're happy to be back as best we can be. Uh, we hope you're going to be with us for this 1971-72 season. Lots of great stuff happening in the year of 1972. And we're going to bring it all to you every single week. And on that note, we'll see you next time. When the ice breaks.